Well, welcome to you all this afternoon. Uh, good to see you if you're here uh, again or if you're here for the first time. Uh, welcome to these classes on Colossians. Uh, so most of you will know that uh, my name is Alistair Wilson. I teach New Testament here. Uh, and Colossians has been a particular interest uh, for me over these past uh, few months, couple of years. Um, I'll just uh, pray and then uh, we'll take some time to recap and then we'll uh, move into the material for today. Oh, welcome to your folks, you're very welcome indeed. So we'll pray. Our gracious Father, help us as we uh, spend this time together, help us to uh, look to you for your wisdom, for your guidance as we read the text of Scripture. May we Use all our uh, abilities in terms of our thinking and our researching to understand it well, but also may we hear you as uh, the living God speaking through these texts. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, just a, a quick recap to uh, let you know where, uh, where we've reached. So, Colossae, a city um, in Asia Minor, the western side of Asia Minor, not far from Ephesus, Laodicea, um, you have a, um, a church which has been planted not by Paul, uh, but through the ministry of Epaphras, and Epaphras has given very encouraging reports of what is going on in Colossae. Uh, Paul gives thanks for all that he hears of the good things that are happening because God is working uh, in that uh, situation. So, uh, to use the phrase that uh, we picked up in our second session, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. And as the gospel is bearing fruit and growing, Paul also prays that the believers in Colossae would bear fruit and would grow. Uh, bear fruit in terms of living a life that is consistent with their profession of Jesus Christ as Lord. Grow in knowledge of God, not just knowledge in terms of facts, but grow in understanding of the relationship into which they have been uh, brought. So he focuses a lot on the gospel, and we spent a fair bit of time uh, in last week's session thinking about the gospel. What is the gospel? And we see uh, in the gospel God's uh, decisive acts on behalf of his people as promised in the scriptures uh, in the person of of Jesus Christ, his son. So that, in a nutshell, is where we've been. Today we're going to uh, focus on uh, a topic um, which I, I've used the perhaps provocative um, title, but it's uh, a phrase just straight from Colossians. He rescued us, or he rescued you, from the dominion of darkness. And then the subtitle, Salvation and Cosmic Conflict in Colossians. Well, that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, so, what do I mean? Well, the issue that we're dealing with here is the issue of uh, salvation. How does God bring about a new relationship with uh, sinful people? And that, of course, raises the question of why there needs to be a new relationship at all. What's presupposed by that? What's gone wrong? Uh, what is the, the problem that has to be dealt with? We'll focus a lot on what God has done, and we'll see that that's a key aspect of Paul's presentation of the material. He doesn't focus primarily on what happens in us or to us, although that is significant, but he puts, puts the emphasis, the spotlight, on what God has accomplished. But one of the aspects that's quite distinctive, not unique, but distinctive in Colossians, is this sense that salvation is a salvation from the dominion of darkness. And there are a couple of texts that we'll uh, pick up that highlight that distinctive theme. And uh, I hope that uh, you'll see something of the uh, particular contribution of Colossians. And we can think perhaps a little bit about how that might be relevant to our modern uh, world. So, uh, on your handout, uh, you should find uh, most of the material that you'll need, including several key texts. So there are probably more uh, that we could look at, but you'll find a, a number there. What you will uh, find is that 
there are many texts which might speak uh, to our subject, but might also speak to other subjects. And so it's sometimes quite difficult to unravel when a text is speaking about one thing and when it's speaking about another. And we'll see as we go through that often a text has significance for quite a number of different aspects of Christian belief and life. So, rescued from the dominion of darkness. Let's see if we can make that work. Okay, I've just identified three key texts uh, from chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, so most of the latter part of chapter 1 of Colossians, and then a section of chapter 2. So what I plan to do is just to work through these in little sections and to highlight some of the issues that uh, arise. So you'll have on your handout there uh, a quotation from the New International Version. Uh, if you have another version available, then you're very welcome uh, to... Uh, look at that. And uh, so let's just read it. And of course, as we uh, read it in this first text, we realize that we're cutting into uh, part of the material that we've already looked at, which was focusing on uh, thanksgiving and on prayer. And so what Paul was, uh, was saying is, I give thanks for all that God is doing amongst you. And then he prays that uh, the uh, evidence of God's work will continue uh, to be uh, evident, and that will be evident in terms of um, the way that they live, their understanding. It will also be uh, evident in uh, endurance and patience, which you see in verse uh, 11. And then in verse 12 we read, And giving joyful thanks... So he's looking also for a life of thanksgiving. Joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit at uh, some of the issues that arise from this particular text. So I've headed our, um, our section here, The Father's Rescue. And I've done that to highlight that the key actor, if we may put it in that uh, way, the key actor, the main actor, the main uh, active person is the Father. Now, I do this because sometimes I think within uh, Christian uh, belief, Christian faith, there can grow a sense that there is a God who is uh, against us because we are sinners and that uh, into the breach steps Jesus the Saviour who guards us from the anger of God that is let loose on us and effectively acts almost like a uh, a lion tamer may, um, may act uh, standing in front of this roaring lion to protect a vulnerable person. Now, of course, there is truth that uh, in uh, the New Testament, in Scripture, God is portrayed as uh, one who is justly, righteously angry with sin. However, that notion that somehow Jesus is uh, the uh, willing and, and uh, gracious person who steps in front of a, a hard and angry God is far from Paul's perception of God. So what we find here is that it is God who is uh, the main actor. He is the one who qualifies. The Father is the one who qualified believers <clears throat> to be a part of God's family and therefore heirs of uh, the family, he rescued us and he brought us. So the, the subject of these verbs is God the Father. So it's important for us to understand that salvation is very much initiated and driven by the, the will and the work of the Father. And likewise, the um, salvation that we will see is very much uh, accomplished by 
the will and the willing engagement of the Son. So there is an entirely harmonious engagement between Father and Son in the work of salvation. There is not one pitched against another. Now the fascinating thing about this portrayal of salvation is uh, that it is a, a very action-orientated presentation. Now in fact, there are many different images that are used for salvation in the New Testament. So uh, we will see uh, a variety of echoes of pictures. So we might speak in legal terms, in terms of justification. We might speak in relational terms, in terms of adoption. We might speak of uh, the, in terms of the, the slave market, <coughs> or uh, the experience of being a slave in terms of redemption. So there are many different images that pick up different aspects of what it means for God to save his people. And sometimes it is like uh, looking at the same thing from slightly different angles, and sometimes it reflects different aspects of uh, the work of salvation. What we have here, it, it always reminds me of the kind of plot of an action movie or an action novel. You can imagine uh, someone uh, captive behind in or within enemy territory, somebody who is powerless uh, to do anything for themselves, but then comes a rescuer and delivers them from the oppression of the one who held them captive removes them into safe territory where they are now free and they are under uh, the authority of uh, a just and righteous governor. It's that kind of storyline of a, a rescue that we find emphasised here. So what has the father done? He has uh, rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom <coughs> of the son that he loves. The language of, uh, I'll just put the text of the, uh, of the scripture back there. The, the language of dominion suggests that there is a very real authority. The dominion of darkness suggests that it is the entire opposite of who God is. God is portrayed as light, uh, the very first uh, words that are characterized, that are uh, ascribed to God, are, are let there be light. The light shines in the darkness, John tells us. So light is characteristic of uh, Jesus, of God. But this dominion is the dominion of darkness. Yet the fact that it is a dominion indicates that it is not to be trifled with. It is not something insignificant or of no uh, concern. And so what we have here is a real predicament that uh, human beings have been in because they've been under the dominion. The implication is of a, a harsh and uh, slave-like experience, the dominion of darkness, and God has rescued them. The image there is, uh, for somebody who is uh, familiar with the scriptures, uh, the image would probably bring to mind the experience of the Exodus. Uh, if you're to understand much of the New Testament, it's important to have the Exodus in mind. Uh, any language of redemption, any language of, that speaks of uh, being taken from slavery into freedom, that, for anyone within the Jewish faith, would bring back uh, recollections of the Exodus as the defining moment in uh, the experience of the people of God. That is when uh, they... Uh, seemed to have been abandoned to slavery, but God stepped in through uh, his servant Moses. He demonstrated his lordship over a pretender to power, because of course Pharaoh effectively um, claimed that he had the power of God. He had the, uh, the call of life or death over the people of Israel. And so God demonstrated his superior authority, his power, and brought them out from slavery to freedom. So what we have here is a kind of echoing of that language of the Exodus. 
And so from the experience of a real uh, but uh, <coughs> harsh rule, we move not to absolute freedom, but to a benign rule, a rule which is gracious, a rule which is righteous. So we are brought not into no man's land or into some sort of uh, world without constraints, but into the kingdom of the Son. Which Son? The Son who He, that is God the Father, who has been mentioned earlier on, loves. So the defining characteristic of this Son in this particular text is that He is loved by the Father. So whereas the dominion of the uh, that was once uh, the experience of human beings, that dominion is a dominion of darkness. The dominion that is the dominion of the sun is characterized by love. It is one in which the father loves the son. Now this language of the kingdom is uh, interesting in Paul because if you read the gospels, particularly the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark and Luke, Synoptic because you can compare them, you can look uh, and see how they compare. If you look in the Synoptic Gospels, you'll see that Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God all the time. Uh, so all of his parables, many of his parables will begin to what shall we compare the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is like this. So Jesus spoke often of the kingdom. But interestingly, Paul rarely speaks of the kingdom. And that's a, a fascinating aspect of the way in which the early church developed, that they were able to speak uh, very clearly about Jesus, but did not feel that they could only use the language that Jesus himself had used. So uh, just as Jesus often spoke of himself as the Son of Man, and the early church, the, the rest of the New Testament, hardly ever speaks of Jesus as the Son of Man, so also Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God, and the later New Testament writers choose to speak in different terms of what uh, Jesus does most of the time. However, this notion that Jesus is king, that, or that he is in a kingdom in which he rules, that is still uh, clearly part of Paul's thought. And so he says that he has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's focusing on what God has done. We looked a little bit about uh, the gospel last week. And I think within uh, the church, there is often uh, a tendency to think of the gospel as uh, what you can experience. So the gospel is the gospel of uh, your uh, sense of peace, your sense of forgiveness, your sense of uh, God's love, whatever it might be. And I don't want to uh, play these down because these are important. But what the New Testament frequently does is rather than point to how we experience something, it points to what God has accomplished objectively, definitively. Because of course our experience and our feeling may vary uh, from day to day and uh, we may feel uh, forgiven or loved by God very much one day, and feel very far uh, from God another day. But by focusing on the objective reality of what God has done, that gives us a solid foundation for understanding what Christian faith means. Uh, we, are not, uh, we are not from day to day, one day liberated from the dominion of darkness, and the next day put back under it. No, there has been a liberation, just as there was an exodus. And that exodus, even though the people of God in, in the time of the exodus had very mixed experiences of um, how they lived in faithfulness to God after the exodus, nonetheless, the exodus didn't unhappen. It didn't uh, revert to the way things were. There was a definitive moment where once they were slaves and now they had been freed. Similarly, for Christians, there is a definitive moment focusing on what God has accomplished rather than how we feel, where we move from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of light. So that is something that God has done. So it's looking past, looking in the past at something historical. Now, what, what moment is it that's being thought of? 
Well, I think there's possibly two ways that we can look at it, and it's perhaps difficult to decide one over another. One is, it happened in history 2,000 years ago. And I think that's clearly the case when we look at a text in chapter 2, that the focus is on a historical moment <coughs> in the experience of Jesus of Nazareth, when he dealt with sin once for all through the cross, and uh, combined with the cross, the resurrection and the <coughs> and so on. But of course also, there is an aspect where when Paul says, um, in whom, uh, sorry, he rescued us and brought us, the experience for any given Christian is the moment at which they enter into Christian faith. So there is a moment for any given person when they were living uh, as effectively uh, under the dominion of darkness uh, and move uh, in conversion into the kingdom of the Son he loves. So it's hard to, uh, to bring these together in an entirely consistent system, but I think both are in view. There is something that happened in our personal lives when we were once not a Christian and then we became a Christian and that was a transfer from the dominion of darkness into the sun, into the kingdom of the sun that the Father loves. However, there is also a sense in which that reality was located 2,000 years before we walked the planet in uh, the person of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave, us, gave himself for us um, and as Ephesians would put it, we were chosen in him before the foundation of uh, the world. So if you ask me how uh, easy is that to grasp, well, then you can imagine that uh, my response is it's not very easy at all. But I think it's important to grasp something of the two aspects, something of our personal past, but also something of that objective historical moment in which God dealt uh, with uh, the powers and with <coughs> sin once for all. So we immediately have this notion of the powers of darkness, so to speak. And that sounds perhaps a little melodramatic to, to many of us, but there's no doubt that it recurs again and again uh, throughout Colossians and indeed throughout the New Testament. So it's important that we take account of the fact that uh, for Paul, the issue that is at stake is not just an issue of a philosophical change, uh, a change of mind or a, a personal uh, decision. It is a matter of cosmic conflict, uh, a, a challenge of uh, the pretender to the throne uh, to the real king uh, who is sovereign. Just one last comment on this slide before we go. Uh, there's so much we could say. But that verse, verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now that moves from the historic side of things, something happened, where we move from one uh, dominion to another, to a present experience. Uh, now we have redemption, that language also echoes the, um, the language of the Exodus, so we have that present experience of having been redeemed, having been bought for God, having been freed and also the forgiveness of sins. Now, these two phrases you'll see are set side by side. Uh, so there's not, uh, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins, but rather we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know if it's used in, in English, but we uh, speak when we're thinking of Greek text, about apposition, where two words are laid side by side. Uh, so you'll often find, for instance, at the beginning of one of Paul's letters, Paul, an apostle. Uh, not Paul who is an apostle or Paul, uh, you know, the apostle, but Paul, an apostle. Two nouns set side by side. And we have something uh, like that here. Redemption, which is the forgiveness of sins. Further explained as the forgiveness of sins. So that tells us that not only do we have a problem uh, to deal with in terms of New Testament theology, in terms of the powers of darkness that oppress, but we also have an internal problem, so to speak, in terms of human sin, human rebellion against God, and so on. Okay, we must move on. Um, the second uh, passage, let me just uh, read it to you quickly. Uh, this is the famous so-called hymn of 
uh, first uh, of Colossians 1, 15 to 20. And it reads, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood, shed on the cross. Now, just a few uh, issues to pick up here, and I'll try not to get as carried away with them as I did in the last section. Uh, the Son rules and reconciles. So here we see this amazing blend of theological themes, all like a tapestry brought together in one single passage. What we find in that passage are issues of Christology, who is Jesus, creation, the echoes of the creation account and a description of what role uh, Christ has played in creation, and salvation, and they're all blended together. They're all related, <coughs> interrelated. Now, the next session that we will have will look at Christ and the church and creation and new creation. So I don't want to uh, go into those territories. We'll look at Christology and uh, the relationship of uh, Christ to his church and the issues of Christ and creation uh, next time <coughs> around. But I just want to, to pick out one or two things here. Christ is uh, described, if I um, go back to the text uh, for uh, a moment, well, in fact, I've used the language of head, but in fact, what's um, the common word that you'll find in both sections, there's really two sections here. The first section dealing primarily with creation, the second dealing primarily with Christ and the church. And in both cases, we find reference to the firstborn. So in verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And then you can see that again in verse uh, 18, uh, he's the head of the body of the church, he's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So the idea of firstborn uh, is not to say first created, as sometimes it's presented. Uh, you can find, uh, for instance, in the Psalms, where David is described as the firstborn. And of course, if you know of the family of Jesse, you know that physically he certainly wasn't the firstborn. Uh, but he is described as the firstborn because it's the place of preeminence, it's the place of choice, the place of calling, uh, and the place of authority. So Christ is presented uh, as the one who is authoritative. He's the one who is over all things. Verse 16, in him all things were created. And then you have this interesting description. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. Now that list of, of terms, I'm sure uh, you may well know, is generally understood uh, to relate not only to human structures, but also to spiritual realities, spiritual powers. Paul seems to use that language in a number of places to suggest uh, authorities or powers in the spiritual realm. And what uh, Paul indicates clearly is that Christ is over them. He is the one who has brought them into being, and he is the one who uh, is authoritative over them. So that was one thing I wanted to highlight there, that in the context of creation, that includes powers that uh, might be those over which uh, God is victor. That's useful for us to think about for just a moment because uh, we can sometimes, as we read scripture, get the impression, if we're not careful, that there is a kind of cosmic, what we might call cosmic dualism. Uh, dualism is a, 
a way of thinking about reality that is common in Eastern religion particularly, but perhaps also in other aspects of religion, where there are kind of two eternally existing forces. If you've ever seen that circle with the black and white tadpole shapes in it, the yin and the yang, uh, it is the idea that there is a constant tension between the good and the bad, the light and the dark, um, and that it is, an, is a never-ending tension, both good and bad eternally existing, both good and bad eternally in conflict, neither ever winning. And that is simply, again, not the uh, teaching of the scriptures. Uh, the uh, Christian uh, religion believes that God is the only uh, sovereign, uh, that all things, including all spiritual powers, are his creation. And therefore, when we do have this cosmic conflict language in uh, Colossians or elsewhere in Scripture, it is not between two equal and opposite forces. Rather, it is a sovereign and a usurper, a sovereign and a rebel. And the rebel may have high hopes, but in fact, his defeat is uh, ensured by the very nature of the one he is rebelling against, who is creator. So we can learn from that that although cosmic conflict is as an aspect of Colossians, it is not an equal fight. The other thing just to pick out here is uh, the idea that the Son accomplishes reconciliation through the cross. Now again, we, we're seeing uh, this idea of, of the cross uh, becoming a key aspect of this conflict. It's fascinating that... There is the image of a battle, but the victory is won not by a display of power, but we might say by a display of weakness. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and we'll come back to that phrase in another place also, all his fullness in Christ and through Christ to reconcile to himself <coughs> all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now that's a tricky text because it might, at first glance, uh, suggest that all of uh, creation, including all individuals, are brought into a, a harmonious, uh, a saving relationship with God. But I don't think that can be substantiated from the rest of the New Testament. There are many, many places where there is a clear exclusion uh, and inclusion. So those who come, for instance, in the, bridegroom, in the bridegroom's garments are welcomed into the wedding feast, but those who do not are excluded. And we might also think of texts in Revelation and in el elsewhere in Paul, where Paul says, such as these will by no means enter into the kingdom of God. So I think that it is... Um, not appropriate to take one text and make it trump all the other texts. However, there is something going on here that suggests that God's action in Christ will bring a total peace. But its commentators, as they reflect on this, suggest that peace can be understand, understood in more than one sense. Uh, in the ancient world, there was such a thing... Uh, called the Roman peace, the Pax Romana. And uh, one, uh, one uh, ancient text uh, said of Rome rather disparagingly, uh, the Roman Empire, they create a wasteland and they call it peace. In other words, the Pax Romana meant that sometimes uh, people uh, who would have been opponents of Rome were subjugated or in fact, in some cases, just wiped out. And of course, then there was peace, but it was a peace of sub, uh, subjugation. Now, while I don't think that the analogy is uh, entirely accurate, I think that notion that peace can be either a willing peace of relationship through um, a reception of what Christ has done in uh, salvation, or it can be a subduing of rebellious forces. I think that that is probably the way in which that text should be understood, that the peace and the reconciliation is not on the same basis for everyone. 
that some will respond to the gospel and will receive uh, the welcome and the liberation that God offers. Some will reject, but there will still be peace, even if those uh, people reject the right kingship of Jesus. So, uh, the sun rules and reconciles. Um, how are we doing for time? Let me uh, take you one more passage and then uh, we'll maybe give you a moment to ask any questions. Um, okay. So here's Colossians 1, verses 21 to 23. It reads, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard of, uh, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now, in this uh, passage, we find a, a general drawing to a, a natural conclusion, a section that we might see as beginning with Paul's reference to the gospel bearing fruit and growing in uh, chapter 1, 5, 6, and moving right through to describe some of the content of that gospel, and then finally concluding with the sense that this is the gospel that has, be pro has been proclaimed, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So, in this section, I just want to highlight a few thoughts of moving from alienation to reconciliation. So again, that language of reconciliation is important. You'll have noticed that a couple of times in the texts in chapter 1. The idea of a, a relationship which has been ruptured and which is now uh, restored, made whole. First of all, the language of aliens and enemies. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, the biblical text there. Once you were alienated... In fact, the, the Greek text doesn't mention God, and so there's a bit of uh, ambiguity about who you're alienated from, but most translations uh, indicate that that alienation is from God rather than from each other. And you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Again, uh, it's often helpful to compare this kind of passage with uh, other passages. You might well compare it with Ephesians chapter 2 and uh, the first uh, few verses of uh, Ephesians 2. So if I just read uh, a few verses there. Um, Ephesians 2 from verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Um, so that language of once being in this situation, now being in this situation, and we'll see that even closer with the text uh, that follows. So, you were once alienated. Reconciliation, again, emphasised as God's action. We did not reconcile ourselves to God, but God reconciled us to himself. It's not an equal equation. It's not a, it's not a, um, a situation where... Uh, God does something and we do something, or, uh, or we initiate and God responds, or anything like that. It's he reconciled you by Christ's physical body. So, again, you see that the reconciliation, the creating of this whole relationship, is accomplished through the surprising, and indeed in the ancient world, the shocking, uh, means of the cross. Uh, I don't have time to go into all the implications of the cross, but... We're familiar with the cross as a symbol, and you'll often see it nicely varnished and, uh, on uh, a wall or a nicely floodlit, or perhaps uh, we have jewellery and, and so on, and it can be an attractive image, but it was simply an image of a torture instrument in the ancient world. Um, as Don Carson says in a little book on the cross, it's a bit like hanging a, a bit of uh, a gas chamber around your neck or something like that. It's, that got, it's got that connotation. And we can lose that a little bit because we become familiar. And that's not to say that there's not a very good uh, reason for 
uh, saying, I am a Christian, I wear the cross with pride. But we can't afford to become familiar with it mm -hmm. because the cross was a, a, an issue of scorn, of horror, of disgust. And part of the reason probably that the New Testament writers do not describe crucifixion uh, in great detail is that everybody knew all too well what crucifixion involved. So we have uh, this reconciliation, not through a pleasant act, but through the cross. And that should at least raise uh, the question in our mind, why was it necessary for there to be a cross? And we can only assume that the reason that the cross happened was that that was what was necessary, that no other route would have been possible to bring about this reconciliation. So God reconciles people through Christ's uh, death, that's the means, but he also reconciles with a purpose. Uh, he reconciled you through death to present you holy in his sight. Again, we saw holy is not primarily an ethical issue, not primarily about how good you are, but primarily how fit for the Lord's service, how uh, appropriate, how marked out for his service you are. And so when Paul uh, speaks of this reconciliation and uh, he speaks about Christ's death on the cross, he says, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed. So this uh, message that Paul mentions here lies at the heart of the gospel. Okay, I've got one more uh, passage that I'm going to look at, but I'm going to give you a moment or two just to ask any questions so that you're not completely... Um, overwhelmed. Uh, so if you've got any questions or if you've got any comments, then you're welcome to uh, to make some now to ask. Anything come to mind or are you quite comfortable? What does it oh. mean when it Sorry. says that it has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven? It's a, an interesting question, isn't it? Because um, at the time of Paul's writing, the only um, the only people that would have been known about were in the Greco-Roman world. And so, so there's probably a measure of um, hyperbole, um, but there's also there's that sense that Paul is saying, whoever, whoever I come across, whoever um, is before me, they will hear the gospel. So there is no distinction. It's not limited uh, to one people group. Uh, it is freely uh, made available. And I think Paul would have this sense, too, that the gospel by this stage, if we assume that Colossians was written um, towards the end of Paul's life, uh, so let's say um, the general range would be uh, either early 60s, which is probably the most common view, or maybe a little bit earlier in the late 50s. But by that stage, he has been serving as an apostle since the early 30s. Um, and so he has been engaged in ministry. The gospel has been spreading uh, in the, the Greco-Roman world, within the Roman Empire, and so Paul could speak with only a, a measure of hyperbole that within his known world, the gospel was reaching all over uh, from a very small, localised beginning. So from our point of view, where we think about, well, what about the folks in Iceland and the folks in... Uh, um, the folks in Latin America and the folks in Australia, well, Paul would have had no conception of them, and I don't think that the, the term should be understood to include all of them. But from his perspective, his known world, uh, then uh, I think it would reflect his sense that the gospel is making huge inroads. Mike, did you want to? Yes, yeah, so I just um, noticed in verse 21. Mm -hmm. A footnote in the NIV. Uh, You're worrying seen... me already. Eh? <laughs> You're worrying me already. Oh, no. So, no. No, 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 Go no. ahead. Uh, I never noticed this before. Uh, once you are alienated from God and got enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. Now, in the footnote it says you were enemies in your minds as shown by your evil behaviour. Okay. And without wanting to split hairs... That, to me, indicates that uh, the evil behaviour is proof of the alienation rather than we were 
uh, we became enemies because of our evil behaviour. The, the evil, but we were alienated okay. as from God and were enemies, mm -hmm. as shown by the way you were behaving, which kind of only backed up the fact that you were already alienated. I never saw, I never saw yeah. that before. I don't know if there's any significance in that, but I thought we'd just mention it. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's that's helpful, and it's always good to um, to look at the the text and to try and figure out. Okay, so because of and as shown by mm -hmm. are both um, are both op op alternative translations. Mm -hmm. Again, just looking at the Greek text, um, the the problem is that um, neither of them <laughs> are are directly in the text. So what you've got is um, and you were enemies. In your mind. So one of the challenges is that there is uh, a form of uh, a form of words in in Greek known as the dative case. If you're into these kind of things, and the dative case can mean in, by, with, uh, for, uh, to, uh, a remarkably versatile um, term. So all that you've got then is n. Tois ergois, tois ponerois, which means, in the dative case, in or by or with your evil works. Mm -hmm. So that that form of that grammatical form has a flexibility about it, which causes problems. We had this chat, I think, uh, a week or two ago, where uh, I think it was yourself, sir, mentioned that um, in one translation there was in Christ. And then in another translation, there was by Christ. And it's the same phenomenon. This, uh, this particular construction, which allows for a variety of nuances. And there, there are slightly different nuances in English. But the dative kind of covers them uh, in Greek. So that's the translators are trying to do the best they can with a construction which they can't quite replicate in English. And so they're forced to make one choice or another, um, other than going the Amplified Bible version where you just give them all. Um, they're forced to make a choice, and so that's why I think they've given the two options. So it's a fair enough comment, though, on the, on the basis of that, to say maybe there's a slightly different nuance. Um, is it that the evil works are, are those that cause... The alienation, or are they those that show an existing alienation? I'm not sure that it would fundamentally change the um, the thrust of the passage, um, because either way there is an alienation. So if the alienation is not by your evil works, it's because of something else, um, some somewhere down the line. It's certainly not something God has caused. But um, but yes, it's a fair comment and an, an interesting question of translation. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. The first question, obviously, we proclaim to every creature, and then we've looked at that verse in verse 21. Mm. Uh, my thought was the understanding of that. We've got this alienation from God, um, being enemies in mind, mm -hmm. and in action and behaviour, mm -hmm. um, which is inherent and in all created by God from mm -hmm. the fall. Um, so is there a sense that what God has placed in us by conscience, by creatorial revelation, proclaims to every creature that there is the option of salvation. That that who we are, that what... If, that, this so the, that the proclamation again? of salvation to yep. every creature comes through, obviously, the cre creatorial purpose, the fact that we, within our conscience, sure. know that we're separated mm. because of our evil needs and our yep. evil behaviour. It's there in our minds, God's placed that of eternity within us he is yep. made us conscious of himself that's a that's a helpful comment that would tie in very much with romans 1 um which would suggest that all are conscious of god's sovereignty god is creator god has placed a, a sense of um of structures and, and the way things should be however it seems in romans 1 that paul wouldn't call that the gospel and so that general revelation, that general sense of God, would be a step before the gospel would then come. And the gospel, 
would generally be focused on the explicit um, proclamation of Jesus as Lord, Jesus as crucified, Jesus as raised. So it's a it's a helpful thought, and and it may be worth pondering to what extent what what is uh, seen is part of that uh, that makes the gospel known to every uh, person. But I think Paul would identify the gospel as something that was focused on Christ. Helpful, thank you. I think it leaves us without excuse Mm -hmm. for God to say, well, I didn't know... uh, The general revelation. The general revelation, but it doesn't save us in any way. No, and I think that what Paul would say about the gospel is the gospel is that which saves. The the gospel is the power of God. So so it it takes us some of the way, but, but doesn't quite help us to make sense, I think, of that issue of the gospel being proclaimed simply through creation. Okay, if I may, I'll take you just one more um, text, and this is Colossians 2, 9 to 12, and uh, I think it's it's very interesting, and what we'll find is that there are, there are kind of echoes which come through once or twice, there are certain phrases or certain themes that you find recurring. So in Colossians 2, 9 to 12, we read, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So you notice that we already came across that language uh, towards the end of chapter 1. The, uh, in, uh, God uh, chose all, that all his fullness would dwell in him. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. So here's the head language that we just sort of saw touched on in chapter 1. In him... You were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Um, Your whole self, uh, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. In fact, this is the first half of the the text I want to look at, so I'm going to, to run through it quite quickly so that we can spend a little bit of time in the in the second part. So here the the theme is being united to Christ. So, first of all we've got the notion the fullness of deity dwells in Christ. So that's now been the second statement of that. So it's not that God dwells in Christ. Uh, Paul is is careful in in terms of, of language because he doesn't want to identify Christ with all that God is. So he he and we have a very challenging uh, thing to do. That So that all that God is, how do we say it? What, what God is, Christ is. Uh, Christ shares divinity. Christ shares the nature of, uh, of God. He, he um, has full divinity. So we might say, in a legitimate sense, Christ is God. Although, interestingly, the New Testament generally is very cautious about using that language. And I think part of that is because Paul wants to protect the idea that the Father is God, and the Father is not the Son. So he doesn't want to end up with what we might call modalism, where God appears in different forms Mm -hmm. in different ways. So when he talks about the fullness of deity, it's like he is trying to say the, the, the essence the, the being of God, the nature of God, that is found fully in Christ. But Christ is not all that God is, because the Father is God, and the Spirit is God. So he uses language in a very measured, careful uh, way. We don't have the full later doctrine of the Trinity in the New Testament, but we have the raw materials and the careful, cautious use of wording that enables us to see how that was a natural development from New Testament material. Then he tells us that uh, Christians are united to Christ. Uh, So he talks about, in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So he uses that same term of fullness again. So that's a remarkable statement, isn't it? That in um, Christ, you have the fullness of God, and you have been brought to fullness Uh, which is uh, a very striking (coughs) statement. That draws in the notion of union with Christ. Union with Christ is a spiritual reality that Paul frequently expresses. It's very characteristic of his thought. And again, it shows that to become a Christian is not simply to 
join a club, to uh, show a particular allegiance, to adopt a particular philosophy, but it is a, a spiritual transformation, a spiritual uniting. Uh, Paul will later say in Colossians, Christ, uh, you are seated with Christ in God, and he will say, Christ, who is your life? So that sense of identity, that bringing together of our identity with Christ's is remarkable in Paul. I'm just going to touch on um, two things relating to circumcision and baptism. In terms of circumcision, Paul relativizes physical circumcision, which was, of course, the covenant sign of the ethnic people of Israel. But he says now to a mixed group, you have been circumcised with um, a circumcision not performed by human hands. So he takes the same language, but he says now it's a matter of the heart. Now it's a matter of a change of your inner being. And what he's saying is not primarily that something has been cut or whatever, but that you have the covenant sign. So as Christians, you are marked as being God's people, regardless of a physical um, procedure, you are marked because of being in Christ. But then in verse 12, you have this remarkable connection of spiritual experience. So because we are in Christ, we are identified with Christ's death and resurrection. So Paul will say, Christ died, Christ was raised. In a similar way, he says, you were buried with him in baptism, you were raised with him in the, by the power of the work of God. So what, ex, what Christ experienced, we experienced. We, that union with Christ, that spiritual reality, leads to a sharing in his experience. So death, death is used a couple of different ways in Paul. Sometimes he'll speak of we were dead in our sins. And that's a bad death. That's, that's a, a death that causes us uh, alienation from God, it causes us uh, destruction, it, it, it promises uh, judgment. But he'll also say, you died with Christ. And in a sense, that's a good death, because that's a death to the, the, the us that was held in bondage to a, a hostile power. But that power has been broken because we died with Christ. And then he says, just as Christ was raised from the dead, so you were raised, so that the life you now live, as he would say elsewhere, he no longer lives in himself, but he lives in Christ. So there has been this dramatic spiritual transformation. Okay, one last text and then we are done. Colossians 2, it's just the remainder of this one. Colossians 2 and 13 to 15. And here's where this theme of being dead is picked up a little further. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. He forgave all our sins, picking up that phrase from earlier on, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. It was taken away, nailing it to the cross, the cross coming through again. And, and here's the cosmic conflict issue coming through again. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So, just very briefly, all were once dead in your sins. That is the condition that Paul uh, assumes of any humanity. Again, Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 11 presents the same pattern. Once again, it is God who is the actor. God made us alive. Just as God brought life to the physical body of Jesus, so he brings life spiritually to those who were dead. So you see the two different angles on death there. A negative death and a death with Christ, which is a, re a releasing death. Then the next bit that I want to draw your attention to is this notion of God having cancelled the charge. Now here's... <clears throat> The, the, perhaps the image that's in mind is the charge that was uh, over the head of Christ. Do you remember that uh, in a crucifixion there would generally be a, a, a charge laid against you, this is the king of the Jews, 
so effectively there is a charge against us. Uh, you are rebels. You are uh, rebels against the just king. And the, the idea is, well, actually that's a perfectly just charge uh, on all humanity. But God has cancelled that charge. That God has cancelled the charge that we have broken the law, broken uh, that we are obliged to face the just uh, judgment of the law, and he has taken it away and he has nailed it to the cross. And again, I think that's that echo of that charge that Jesus had against him. So effectively, Jesus, by taking a charge against him on the cross, removed that from us. But it wasn't just a passive thing. Here's the fascinating verse, verse 15. In the cross, God disarmed the powers. Now, it's a, an, an impression of, of a kind of military um, sweep that, that brings a, an, op, an opposing foe to being powerless. But he does that, he brings about that powerlessness through the cross. And then he makes a public spectacle of them. The, um, the image there is of a Roman triumph. Uh, the, that image of a Roman triumph uh, appears a number of places in the New Testament. Paul speaks about we apostles at the end of the line uh, as those condemned to die. Uh, and all of these images are images of a Roman triumph where a conquering general would march uh, through a city. Uh, you find various uh, Various things like the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, the, the triumphal arch. You'd march your way through the arch as the conquering journal, uh, general showing the, um, the, the spoils, showing the defeated foes, showing the defeated general, and they would be brought to the Colosseum <coughs> or whatever and condemned and killed. So um, God in the cross does that to those powers that would stand against him okay so uh, and that's just what i've said so the conclusion the father initiates salvation he achieves victory over hostile forces and he deals with human sins the two aspects of the problem we might say but the son enacts salvation believers share in his death and resurrection and he accomplishes salvation not through power but through the cross so thank you for your patience. I realise that uh, time has gone. I don't know if anyone has a last question or comment or if we should just leave it there. Anyone got a last question or comment? See what it says, uh, disarming the powers and authorities. In the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, it talks a lot about demon possession and all of that kind of thing. Is that largely disarmed now? Because we don't see that yeah, I, as much. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I would say that the New Testament presents... The, um, the Gospels as a battle zone. It's where the kingdom of God is proclaimed and the, the demonic activity that is presented is a kind of last gasp uh, re rebellion and the battle is won decisively. Uh, a German theologian, a Swiss theologian called Oskar Kuhlmann uh, famously presented uh, the situation between then and now as the cross was D-Day. The cross was D-Day. The battle was won decisively. Once for all, the foe could never come back. But the skirmishes continued. The, there is still the tension. There's still the battle. One day, when Christ returns, there will be VE Day, where the, the, the fighting will cease. The end of the story will come. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for that news that the battle is won. We thank you for that message that Christ is king and he has defeated the foe even as he was killed on the cross because death could not hold him. And you intended that the, the enemy would overreach himself and that he would find himself defeated by his own uh, extravagant uh, actions. Thank you, Lord, for the wonder of your plan. Thank you that you have brought a people to yourself, dealt with the enemy and dealt with our sin. And we pray that we might uh, know great comfort and confidence from knowing that the battle has been won and the people have been saved for yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, so next week...
is uh, a reading week here at the college, so there won't be any classes, and that will include uh, this class, so that there will be no class this week. The next class will be the following week. So the, that's the second week of the school holiday. So although the schools are still off, the college is back. Uh, so just next week where there's no class, and then the classes resume the following week. So I hope I'll see many of you then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah.